the last part of our tour, we were at the brazen altar. But as you continue past the brazen altar, the next thing that you see before you get to this hill that's in the, the back of the outer court that is the sanctuary, you, you see a bronze basin or bronze laver, depending on which translation you use. It's, it's kind of a bowl that's on a stand made out of bronze and it's filled with water and it is directly between the altar and the tabernacle as you're as you're going to enter into the sanctuary and it's at this place that when a priest was done with a sacrifice and they would have blood on their hands and they would have dirt on their feet from wearing sandals in a wilderness, they would come to the brazen basin and they would wash their hands and they would wash their feet in the waters and they would put on the special garments that they were allowed to wear only in the holy place and they would enter into the holy place to, to serve God. This brazen basin, this, these waters of washing, these, these represent the waters of baptisms. Now, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 6, he talks about the, the basic principles that we need to learn, and one of them is understanding the doctrine or the teachings about baptisms. Now, this is a plural word because it's not a singular baptism. The most popular baptism that most of us have heard about is the baptism with water. This is the place where we identify with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, where we come, we become one with that, and, and, and we get transformed through this physical act that represents something that happens spiritually, that happens spiritually, and is happening spiritually. But it's also Beyond that, it also talks about the baptisms. There's also the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where we get immersed in the presence of Holy Spirit, where he comes upon us and he overwhelms us, where he washes us. This in, in Ephesians, Paul tells the, the believers in Ephesus that they should be not drunk with wine, but be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this word, be filled with the Holy Spirit, literally, it's a continual filling. It's not a once and done thing. It's constantly being filled and then 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 filled because there's always more of Him that's available. There's something powerful in understanding both of these baptisms. But the water also represents something else. Again, in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is talking, and, and like Paul does sometimes, he's talking about a man and his wife, and he's like, you know, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for washing her with the water of his word to remove spots and wrinkles so that she would be holy and blameless as she should be. Now, notice what it says, washing her with the water of his word. This water is also the washing that happens as we come and we begin to identify with the life of Christ. This is the doctrine of baptisms. We're identifying with the work of Christ, the life of Christ. We come to scripture and we begin to see what Christ has done and what Christ has accomplished in our lives. And in that identification, it begins to remove spots and wrinkles, spots are those, that guilt that we have for the things that we've done, wrinkles is, is the iniquity, the shame from the things that have been done to us and from the patterns that are in our, our life. And God removes these things through the washing of the water of his word. It's this transformation that happens by the renewing of the mind. As we take on his truth, it changes us from the inside out. This is the washing of the water of word. This is the place of repentance where we wash our hands. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? But he was clean hands and a pure heart. And we cleanse our hands as we come near to ascend to the presence of the Lord. 
It's also what Jesus did to his disciples in the upper room, where he takes off his outer garments and he wraps a towel about him and he washes their feet. And, and Peter's like, well, you're not gonna wash my feet. And, and Jesus is like, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have anything in me. Your feet need to be washed before you go deeper. The, the priests had to wash their feet before they went deeper. And Jesus tells Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have anything in me. Like, well, wash all of me. No, 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 you don't, you, the whole thing doesn't need to be washed, just your feet. Because you've been walking through the world and there's stuff that's on you and it needs to come off as you go deeper with him. This is this life of continual repentance where we're constantly clean before him. And Jesus told Peter, what I'm doing you don't yet understand, but you're going to understand. Because as we get to understand the deeper things of the Spirit, it becomes easier and easier to recognize the power of repentance and the cleansing that comes from the humility and the service of what Jesus Christ did to make us a people ready to go deep with God and to enter into his presence. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? He was clean hands and a pure heart. Here's another thing that we learn from the tabernacle of Moses.